Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Michael Shanks. What an amazing venue. Um, I just have to thank you for inviting me here and boy to this uh, very special location. It's a church. And I have to say that um, some of us get quite evangelical about design thinking. And uh, so it's entirely appropriate. Okay, so I'm going to try and walk you through um, this wonderful, well, this wonderful term design and what is getting called design thinking. Um, there, right. So, um, in the United States, I don't know if it's the same in the Netherlands, but in the United States, this notion of design thinking is really getting uh, quite hot. Um, I'm at Stanford University. Uh, we have a design division, uh, a design program, and a relatively new uh, unit called the D School, the design school. And um, we are frankly quite uh, almost inundated with interest about what is getting called design thinking. Um, it's very, very much been taken up by the business community. This is just a selection of some of the books uh, in the last three, four years um, that have come out on this topic. Um, a lot of our classes in the D School get filled by, yes, engineers, yes, people who are on the design program, but also people who are coming to us from the business school. And uh, business schools, indeed, across the US are uh, embracing design thinking. Um, but it's still quite a mystery. And it's become seen really as something of a, for some people, a bit of a, a fad, a ma the latest thing in management. Um, and certainly we get, um, I, I, I come across business school students who you know, are ticking the box. Oh yeah, I've done the class on uh, design thinking as part of the MBA. Uh, and on they go to do other things. How seriously is it being taken? And what exactly is it? Uh, but I think uh, certainly in the US, it is, it is one of the items top of the business agenda. But because people think that design is going to generate innovation, um, it's about being creative. Some people are saying in the US for a little while now that the next MBA, an MBA is a master of business administration, um, and it's the kind of you know, it's the thing to get to get into business. You go to Stanford, you go to Harvard Business School, get an MBA, and it uh, guarantees you a career, or so they think. Um, <laughs> uh, but an MBA business, some people are saying the next MBA is an MFA. What's an MFA, you ask? The MFA is a Master of Fine Arts, the terminal degree in the arts. So be creative, get an MFA, and you will be successful in business. Well. That's the notion. But, but again, what exactly does that mean? So let's have a little look at this notion of design. What do we understand by design? First of all, um, the, you know what this is, of course. Um, uh, it's designed. It's sometimes said that one of the reasons for Apple's success is not technological innovation. Um, the iPhone is by no means the best phone on the market. It never was. But that's kind of not the point. Uh, the point about an iPhone is, ooh, it has a lure. You know, it's kind of designed by Jonathan Ive, Sir Jonathan. And there is a story um, with some degree, I think, of uh, justification that one of the successes that the return of Steve Jobs brought to Apple was that he, uh, very soon after his return to Apple in the late 90s, uh, he brought into the company, Jonathan Ive, a designer, a British designer. And that started a range of products, all of which have the I in front of them. Uh, the, so Jonathan Ive is the I in Apple, the design um, component to it. This is designed. That brings success. There is that mystique then about design. What does it mean? It's styling, um, definitely branding these shiny surfaces, the materials, the quality of finish that go with Apple, that's become part of the brand. Um, the aesthetics, the graphics, indeed. Um, this is often associated with design, graphic design. And of course, the little icons that form part of a graphical user interface are an aspect of graphical design, of course. And then the interface, interacting with the iPhone, the touchscreen, and such. It wasn't new tech, it was innovative 
design that seems to have lain behind the successes. Um, but, and here is Sir Jonathan. Um, but the point I want to really explore with you tonight, or show and hopefully convince you, um, if you're not already convinced, is that design is so much more than this. That's a traditional view of design. In fact, industrial design, product design, which has so characterized um, our manufacturing economy for the last two centuries, industrial design is typically associated with styling. It's, the, it's almost, it, it is in some ways superficial. It's, it's the look, it's the surface, it's the packaging that goes around things. So car designers, the heart of an automobile is the engineering. The car designer adds a styling front surface to it. Uh, there's a lot more to design than that. But nevertheless, it can remain at that level. So let's probe a bit deeper. And the implication of this argument that design is so much more than what we typically understand by styling is that design is too important to be left to the likes of Sir Jonathan. Um, so, let's get into this notion of design. What do we understand by it? Um, first of all, I think there's a growing, um, and for some time now, there's been a growing awareness of design in the world. Uh, the word is used a lot more now. Uh, we all kind of have a bit of an angle on it. Uh, not necessarily that we agree on what design is, but we all kind of are aware of it in our lives. Um, this is design awareness. Some of us have a deeper design awareness, or a shallower, or a different, a varied uh, awareness of design. Sometimes it is that it's about styling. Sometimes it's, ooh, you know, design is about the curtains in your room, or it's about your kitchen. Um, it's, again, about the look of things. Um, for others, though, um, it can be, uh, you know, sort of uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier or uh, a car as produced by you know, Chris Bangle, who gave BMW their rather distinctive look over the last 15 years. Um, so it's an association with the designer and these things. But whatever design awareness is part of our world in a way that it hasn't been uh, indeed in recent history or indeed at all. Design awareness. The second um, aspect of design I think we can all agree on is that design is, um, uh, it is a really quite sophisticated practice, body of practice. Um, Rotterdam is indeed, as indeed is the, Nether the Netherlands, um, a home of design practices, design studios, architecture, architectural studios are highly sophisticated affairs uh, where you are going from conception through to building um, sometimes quite incredibly complex structures. Design practice is a high-end, collaborative, multidisciplinary effort, absolutely. It happens in studios, um, particular kinds of organization, particular kinds of space, design practice. Um, last 20, 30 years and more um, have seen a growth in design research where we've become, again, aware of design and want to know more, and there's been a serious effort to get into, for example, how a design studio such as an architectural practice works. What goes on? What's the process? Um, what range of skills are involved in moving from the brief to build something to its finished uh, form? Design research has taken us from, for example, architecture into product design, but much further. Um, what are the limits of design? You can research that. That is, look for common practices from the design studios of architects through to, well, where? So finding out about design, it's a field design research. A lot of it, of course, occurs within the academy, um, but it is a sub-discipline of sometimes quite extraordinarily um, good work. Um, finally, design thinking. And this is where it's a little bit fuzzier, perhaps. Um, design thinking, I'm going to try and uh, show, is a way of describing the design process. Unfortunately, it's not a good term, design thinking. Um, it's not really about thinking. It's about doing. It's a practice. But it does involve thinking. It's thinking and doing. And then, really, it's not just about design. 
It's actually about a lot of other things, too. So design thinking is neither wholly about design, nor is it all about thinking. But anyway, it's the term we have, and it's used in the literatures and all sorts, so I thought we better stick with it so that we don't confuse things even more. Okay. Um, to, tr to take us further into this, I'm going to run through a short um, uh, history of design from basically the 1960s or thereabouts. Hopefully it isn't too familiar to you, um, and even if it is, I hope that it can kind of form a, a, a clarification, a baseline, a foundation for us to move further on with uh, this notion of design thinking. Um, let's start with the 60s and the emergence of what sometimes gets called human factors um, is other times associated with the term of ergonomics. And it's really not difficult to understand this. Um, if you're designing a chair, um, you can uh, design it according to some very basic principles. What do chairs do? Well, they support you, your bottom, when you sit on it, okay? And sometimes they have arms, and that's about it, really. So you can imagine, you can design a chair, there's the back, there's the, uh, the seat, and two arms and some legs, okay? Does that mean it's going to be a good chair? Well, it might look nice if you make it out of nice materials, it's got nice lines and all sorts. However, we do know as well that the finest looking chairs can also give you a dreadfully bad back um, if you're sitting um, at them trying to work or something like this. The question, what is good design, does not mean it has simply to mean that the chair looks good. Um, the science of ergonomics, ergon in Greek, is a work, is work. So ergonomics is the science of work, how things work with you. And if they work against you, they give you a bad back, a bad neck, and repetitive strain in, uh, injury. Um, in the workplace especially, you don't want that to happen, because it's going to mean your employees take time off and you lose money. Uh, but also it means you've got to look after your um, uh, employees and make sure they don't get sick. Um, so. Ergonomics arose as a field to inform design so that things worked with people. And how do you do that? Well, it's very simple in some ways. You just make sure that if you have a chair, it fits the human form. So one of the basic principles behind ergonomics is human factors. That is, measuring people, anthropometrics, finding out what the range of variation is, for example, in a workforce, a community, so that you design to those measurements, those features of the human form. Very straightforward, but it requires a whole body of knowledge for doing that. You need statistics, you need measurements, you need to go out and research, another form of design research, you need to go out and research your people to make sure your objects fit. It's an old science, anthropometrics, which is why I have Leonardo's Vitruvian uh, man up there. Um, and I hope you recognize the point in the, uh, the diagram at the, point at the bottom that it's about arrangements between people and things and managing them in a quite uh, physical way through uh, this um, measurement of the human form. It's important. Um, this here is a, a dear friend of mine who's sadly no longer with us. This is Bill Mogridge. Um, Bill Mogridge um, was... Um, an engineer, designer, product designer, who worked on uh, what we see here, which is the grid compass, one of the first commercially successful laptops. The first, so it's often claimed. Um, Bill uh, worked on a key component of the early laptop, which was the hinge between the keyboard and the screen. Um, it's a key aspect to the laptop, of course, because you want it to sit on a table or on your lap, uh, and you want the screen to be at the right angle, and, of course, to be communicating, to be wired into the keyboard and the power supply and the CPU. Um, and it was, at the time, quite an engineering challenge to make that hinge uh, work and so that it could go at the right angle and that you didn't lose connectivity and all the rest. Um, but Bill told the story of what, had hap what happened when the design team eventually had the laptop in front of them, the laptop sitting there on their lap. And he, and he described it like this. He said, you know, I'd spent all of this time on the hinge. I opened up the laptop. 
Uh, and even in those days, which was uh, an MS-DOS um, command line interface, so it wasn't a nice graphical uh, interface, um, he, he said, you know, all that work I'd put into the hinge just kind of drifted off into insignificance when I realized that here I had something within a rather intimate personal space. It was here, there, in front of you. You opened it up, and you opened up a window on another world. The world of the software, the world beyond the screen. Now, we know that you know, the window as a metaphor has become you know, a daily metaphor in our lives now. And it is a window on another world. And for Bill, that meant that this process of design that he'd been through was not actually about the artifact at all. It was about an interaction, an interface, a door, a window into another world altogether. And so he, with that epiphany, that aha moment, Bill decided that what he was doing and should be doing was not designing mechanical connections, hinges, and such. That was only a means to an end. In fact, his world was a world of designing interactions with things. And Bill, therefore, uh, started off a whole uh, uh, wave of design. Design, not about the artifact per se, not about the artifact in itself, but the artifact in its relationship with you. Person plus thing in interaction, interaction design. Um, In the 1990s, two um, business gurus, I'm very suspicious of these characters, who write these uh, popular books, they get their six-figure uh, publishing advances, adv advances, and then uh, come out with the latest management fad or the latest management hype, telling you you need to know this, you need to know that, this is the way the world is, and this is how to make lots and lots of money. Um, and Joe Pine and Jim Gilmore, when I came across them, I thought, ooh, they're just another couple like that. Um, they came up with an idea in the 1990s uh, called the experience economy. And it was Joe Pine and Jim Gilmore that convinced me um, that actually this kind of business publication can be phenomenally, wonderfully good. Uh, their notion of the experience economy is extraordinarily perceptive. They're really great about this. They make a very simple point. Um, when you go into Starbucks, um, this was one of the first real successes of what they're calling the experience economy, um, you're not buying a cup of coffee. Because um, if you were, you'd not be paying what you are for it. Um, whether you like Starbucks or not, and I hate Starbucks, but um, whether you like Starbucks or not, um, what Starbucks have made their money out of is creating, selling, um, an environment and an experience. That is, you go to Starbucks, you get your coffee, but you get choices. And you, know, you can make lifestyle choices. Around coffee, yep. Absolutely, and you know all about this. You want to, and I can't remember all the different varieties they have. That's the point. There's always another one that can open doors of experience for you. Um, this place, though, is, is part, I think, of that. It's an illustration, a different kind of illustration of the same thing. Um, this is a bar, um, a hotel bar in, in Rotterdam. And um, a, it's a beautiful space where you can sit in a, a comfortable, comforting, environment that doesn't impose itself on you, um, and you're not just eating food there. No, you're being there. You know, it's kind of like you're in place, and you, you, can, you just feel right, maybe. Um, certainly, I kind of do. So what's going on here, though, is that the design is not just about things, no. It's not product design, nor is it interaction design. It's more than that. What's going on is, an arrangement of things chosen in an environment, in this experience. And um, in fact, uh, you heard the Lego experience this morning, uh, this, uh, earlier, of uh, moving through an environment in an experience, the before, the during, the after. You take account of these in creating experiences. So, design. Moving through those three kind of phases, product, human factors, ergonomics, interaction, centered on the user and the thing, and then environments. People plus things plus experiences. And I've put a term up there that's going to be pertinent uh, uh, as I move on with my argument. Human ecologies. And I've spelled it a bit weirdly. Um, and this is because, OK, so uh, I've got a, a background that's going to be relevant in a minute again. So I'm an archaeologist. 
So I'm interested in long-term human relationships with things. Um, I'm also an anthropologist, plus my particular field is Latin and Greek. Um, and so I'm really into etymologies and where words come from. And that can be incredibly pedantic, but on the other hand, it can sometimes, I think, be enlightening. Ecology is a beautiful word. We know about it, it's about you know, environments of species, living communities of people and things in environments. Okay, but the derivation from Greek is oikos. So it's oikology, as up here. What's the oikos? The oikos is the household. It's our home and it's placing in the world. Human ecology is the basis, it's the, it is the environment of people and things within which experiences occur. And it references being at home. Okay? So our home space, our home base, our habitat. That is what experience design in many ways is focusing on. At least if you look at it positively, and I do. So design. Um, I like to take a broad view, given indeed the history over the last 30 years of design. I think it's a, a, a profitable history in, in every sense. It's moving in the right direction. It's broad. It involves the entanglement of people and things, the arrangement of things in our habitat, and how we rearrange them. It's about how we manage those relationships. It's about fabricating those environments, relationships, those ecologies of people, animals, plants, things, environments, events, memories, remains, whatever, that are per anything that is pertinent to the human condition. That is, anything that has particular relevance or impact upon us. And so, under this notion of ecology, and this proposition that I'm putting in front of you, um, to design is to be human. It is actually part of the human condition. And that's how I would take, with my archaeologist hat on, my anthropologist hat on, for as long as we've been human, we've been designers. I'm not going to go so much into that argument, and I would give you lots and lots of evidence to that, event, to that effect, but I just want to follow through some of the uh, points about this breadth of view, because I think it's crucial. This is one of the reasons, because of the extension of design with this definition into how we arrange the world about us, how we intervene in it, how we work with things, how we fabricate, how we manage and work with things, under that notion, um, design absolutely is too important to be the left to the designers, because we're all a party to it. Um, design them. Being in the world, habitat, it's a process. In terms of what I've been saying, well, just describing, let, let me go into this now, because the, the term design thinking um, is typically used to refer to the process of arrangement, fabrication, rearrangement, disposition that I've been describing. And I'm going to give you an example. Okay, so it's about broccoli. Yeah. Um, this is a, a, an example I borrowed from uh, another colleague and friend, David Kelly, and uh, uh, IDEO, the company, uh, the consultancy, um, based all around the world and all sorts. Um, the, the case study is online, but I don't think they do it justice. Um, so I'm going to tell a slightly different story about it. It's about school lunches. Um, I've got two kids. They're growing up now. I've got a 16-year-old daughter and a 13-year-old son. And uh, they're at uh, school in the United States. But I think this is an issue that we all, parents, but also any of us who've been through school, that's most of us, come across. And it's about, well, from my point of view, um, uh, my son, um, I think he would accept it, he, he likes sugary things. Um, and, you know, I, I make him lunches. We've been very dutiful, me and Helen, my wife, and we make the kids lunches. We always have good lunches. And we make soup. And we put it in a nice container. And we give him the nicest soft bread roll to go with it. It's nice and warm. He takes it to school. And it comes back absolutely untouched. And, okay, now we know that maybe it wasn't hot enough. Let's try a different flavor. But also we know that, that Ben is, yes, very fond of sugary things. And I'm convinced, and I, I know, that what he's doing is, you know, he's got his stash of Laffy Taffy 
It's an American candy. It's gorgeous stuff, actually. Banana flavored is the best. He's got his stash of Laffy Taffy there, and that's what he's feeding himself with when he's at school. Now, he has the option of school lunches. He can go into the canteen. We can give him his $5 a day. Um, but we know he's got choice there, right? And he's just going to, is he going to make good choices, bad? It's a worry. You're worried about healthy school lunches and about whether the school is doing its best by you to make sure that your kids get the nutritional dinner, lunch they need. And you also know they don't like it because they want to have bright yellow, bright orange, pink Laffy Taffy with a sugary Gatorade for lunch. It's an issue the world over, unless you've got some gorgeous you know, angel of a child who you know, eats fresh broccoli salad every day. Now, what do you do about this? We all know we've got to look after our kids. It's health issue. Schools, um, food companies, what can we do to make this better? It's a problem. Maybe we want them to eat broccoli, but they don't like broccoli. Maybe we could turn it pink, like Laffy Taffy. Maybe we could coat it in mm, artificial sweetener. Oh, that's bad. No, that's bad. Uh, maybe we could disguise it as something else. Um, maybe we could come up with healthy food that looks like candy. <laughs> Um, you, there's all those issues. That's a design challenge. Wow, can you imagine if you could come up as you know, a designer, food designer, with this food that kids loved, um, and, and yet it was the equivalent of broccoli? Okay, this is the problem that uh, IDEO um, uh, faced with San Francisco uh, Public School District. How do they improve school lunches so that the kids would get a healthier meal rather than all these issues um, of uh, choice, not choosing the right things, the right things not being available, and even when they are, um, they don't uh, eat them. And uh, this is how it went. How do you approach that problem? The one that I've just in indicated is you can start by saying, we know what the problem is. Uh, kids don't like healthy food, so let's disguise it. But that doesn't work really. We know it doesn't. Um, it's so, IDEO followed through a process that we're calling design thinking. Um, what does that involve? Uh, you, well, you can, I'm not, you're too big for me to ask you questions uh, from the floor here. I'd love to. We could get interactive here. We all know what school lunches are like, and I've kind of described some of it. What are school lunches about? Are they about going and having lunch? Typically, no. We all know that, right? It's not about going and having your broccoli salad. What is school lunch about? It's about going and hanging out with your friends because you've been stuck in a damn classroom all morning with some horrible teachers doing stuff you never wanted to do, or even if you're dutiful and great, you want to get on with your homework, right? So school lunch is not about food per se. And the re when you go in and do your ethnographic research, when you go and look at the kids, talk to them, of course you're going to find it, and you do, you find this out. So the problem actually, if you just stand back from it, take the evidence at face value, the problem is not about healthy food, unhealthy food. It's about the nature of the lunch experience. It doesn't work for kids. So design challenge. It's not about creating a better food. It's about re-engineering, redesigning the lunch experience. If you want to address the issue of kids eating certain things and not eating certain things and doing certain things and not doing certain things at lunchtime. So IDEO did the ethnography, talking to kids, observing, watching, seeing and finding out what kids really wanted to do at lunchtime. Not stand in a queue waiting for broccoli salad. They wanted to sit down with their friends, uh, do their Facebook or whatever it is they wanted to do at uh, lunchtime. And so IDEO and San Francisco schools flipped the issue. Instead of school lunches being about lunch, it was about everything you wanted to do. You go, you hang out. There are tables where, my goodness, you can talk and do other things that you're not supposed to do. So you create a space where the kids have um, freedom, agency, to do what they want. And then as a part of that, because they're hungry, because they've been in class all morning, um, you provide the food as an ancillary to that experience. And they eat it. It doesn't matter what you give them. They eat it. Because they're doing what they want to do. Because school lunch was never about lunch anyway. So what you've done is find out, attend to the people you're interested in, look at what the experience is really about, and redesign to fit that need 
that desire. Um, the solutions involved recreating, redesigning the experience. I don't want to go into those at this stage. Um, I just want to point out to you what the process looks like. This is a diagram we use regularly. There are many diagrams like this available, and they're all kind of variations on a theme. They're useful. Um, I'm going to throw some doubt on them in a moment, but they're useful. You start out with empathy, empathize. All that means is you go and realize what kids are up to. <laughs> so, and, and we kind of, sometimes we get it already. Sometimes it takes more research to figure out what's going on. Uh, define the issue. It's not about food, it's about the experience of lunchtime. Ideate. How can we make the experience of lunchtime better? 15 varieties of possibility, 15 different things we could do. Give them better tables at the right height, have them cluster together, get rid of queues, lines for food, etc. Prototype it, try it out. Um, give it a go, see if it works, get some feedback from the school kids, um, and finally, test it out. Run it through some schools, modify, change it if necessary. That is the design thinking process. But what is it exactly? Let's go a little bit further into this. It's not a method. I've given you a diagram there, but if you try following it through stage by stage, you're not necessarily going to turn up with the goods. Um, it's a pragmatics. It's a way of operating. It's a way of li you're listening. You're trying to figure things out. You pull it together. You try brainstorming. You prototype. That just means get on with it rather than try and top-down design, rather than try and do all your research, figure it out, figure out every possible issue, and then design to try and take them all into account. No, just get on with it. Um, it's a set of methods, but with no indication of which ones you should use when. It's, and the methods can include, well, how do you ask the kids what they're up to? What's going on? Um, how do you ideate? What's that mean? How do you come up with different ideas? How do you prototype? These are method fields but no indication of exactly how you should do it. That's why it's a pragmatics. It's a set of strategies, a set of tactics, and it's focused indeed on needs finding and problem solving, getting kids to eat broccoli. Um, and indeed, it does deliver innovation. Just about every time, even though the innovation might not work, you'll come up with something new if you follow it through. It's tried and tested like that. Um, and this is why this broad field of approach, this pragmatics operating in the world, this is why I'm insisting that it's not a management fad. Um, it is a way of operating in the world way beyond just management, way beyond business. And it's why I'm saying to design is to be human. Although, of course, we know that we're not always allowed to be either creative or human. And that is one of the key issues behind the adoption of design thinking or our realization of what it is. Another way of showing some aspects of this, and particularly that this is not something brand new, I'm going to give you a little case study again now, another example, uh, but from the beginnings of the industrial modern world. And it's a classic case study that we get in design history, um, and it's the case of Josiah Wedgwood. And I hope it might be a little familiar to some of you. If not, I'll explain. Josiah Wedgwood was an English uh, industrialist come designer, uh, he ran a pottery firm, very successful pottery firm. It only went bust about five years ago. Um, so pretty good record, a couple of centuries of success. Josiah Wedgwood, the first industrial designer. And here is a kind of measure of his achievement. Uh, this is um, Derby porcelain, not produced by Josiah Wedgwood. Um, this was a rather high-end manufacturing process uh, that had come to Europe, discovered in Europe in the early uh, 18th century, extremely expensive, um, yes, profitable, but in a limited way. It was, it was craft made, um, and well, yes, uh, I'm not going to talk about taste. It was very tasteful at the time. Um, this was done without design thinking. This is what Josiah Wedgwood produced through design thinking, a radically different, innovative, and extremely successful design. This is uh, blue jasper ware, um, produced in the Wedgwood factories, as you can see, 1785. The factory. He started making pottery, not in workshops, studio workshops, craft workshops, small, print, prod, small um, making runs. Uh, no, he produced this pottery in some of the first factories of the Industrial Revolution. This um, is his uh, pottery works 
at a place he called Etruria. Now, Etruria, you may know, is not in Stoke-on-Trent in the Midlands of England. Etruria is in Italy. Why? Wedgwood, in naming his factory Etruria, was making a... Well, he was creating one of the first brands in the modern industrial world. Let me explain how that works. More than that, you can see here we've got a, a horse pulling a barge. The barge is on a canal. The canal network in England is one of the first major infrastructural transport systems of the Industrial Revolution. You can ship heavy goods, materials, products efficiently, low cost, around Britain using that network. You can produce, ship in bulk. The factory mass produces. It's not the production line of Ford yet, but what Wedgwood does is he breaks down the skill set that produced the Derby porcelain. High end, very sophisticated, that is, you needed high skills to be able to produce Derby porcelain. He broke it down, division of labor, into more manageable, less skilled components, which we know, de-skilling, division of labor, is a key component of the Industrial Revolution. He produced the pots, using, as you can, uh, the pots in a factory system using centralized uh, power, we can see the chimneys for the heating, for the kilns, um, and more. What's this funny thing, set of things up at the top? Um, one of the bottlenecks or um, limits upon making ceramics in the mid-18th century was the skills involved. Um, when you're firing clay, you stick it in the kiln, crucial is the temperature to which you fire your pots. It has to match, you need it to match with the maturing temperature of your clay body. Don't need to go into details about this, it's just you've got to get the temperature right. How do you measure the temperature to get it right? Um, in traditional craft production, such as Derby porcelain, you have a kiln manager, part of the potting team, who knows how to view a kiln. You open up the little bunghole, you look at the flame, the color of the interior of the kiln, and on the basis of the color, you can tell the temperature. Now, that takes 30 years of practice to get there. It's a skill that comes with extreme experience. But it means you've got to spend 30 years training somebody, right? And what's more, you're dependent on them to get it right. And they might get it wrong. So what did Wedgwood do? He invented the first pyrometer. And that's what that is. Um, it's a, what these are, materials that uh, melt um, at different temperatures. You put a range of them in your kiln, you look at them, and you can tell from which one's melted exactly the temperature of the interior. And you can do that with five minutes training. But he invented the pyrometer so that he could do this kind of thing on scale. He also was into chemistry. How do you get the right clay for your pots? How do you produce porcelain? You go, typically, in the traditional world, to your uh, uh, clay pit, your clay pit manager, the expert, and say, you know that clay we got last year? It was superb. Can I have some more? And he says, oh, yes, I know where I got it from, and I know how to do it, and all the rest. And it, it's almost alchemical in composing materials. You cannot specify the chemical composition of a material in the early 18th century. You can by the time of Wedgwood. So he can specify his material. He can control temperature. He can control the process by division of labor. That brings the costs down. And he also developed new materials. It wasn't just porcelain that he was interested in producing. Porcelain, difficult work, expensive. Quality issues, you lose a lot. So Wedgwood, and this is one of the first examples, this one here, produced some new, radically different, relatively high temperature fired stonewares. And this is black jasper up there. Um, what it led to was a material, this is his ceramic material, which was extremely consistent, high quality, um, good success rate, 80 to 90% success rate in the kilns, compared with 20% uh, success rate prior to that. So he's getting far more product out, higher quality, consistent, and he can do it over and over again at lower cost. But what's he got here? What's this? This is one of the finest products of the Roman glass industry. It's called the Portland vase. It's um, a cameo. The white on dark is glass, white glass on blue glass. The Artisan in the Roman world has carved away the white to reveal the blue and show off these figured shapes. It's by far the most extremely accomplished piece of glasswork from the ancient Roman world, and they were good at glass. 
um, Wedgwood has reproduced it in his new ceramic jasperware. The highest production, highest quality production of ancient civilization reproduced in the 18th century and arguably even better because everybody can have some of this. It's relatively cheap. Um, this is another example of the same thing, but ceramics. This is a pot from a grave in Etruria. That's why he's called his factory Etruria. This is from a grave, an ancient grave, in northern Italy. Um, it's a pot from the ancient world. This is Wedgwood's copy. Exactly the same, kind of, um, but totally different. Produced by 18th century technology. The pot you've just seen, the ancient one, belonged to this guy. This is Sir William Hamilton. Uh, he was um, plenipotentiary of the court of St. James at the court of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies in Naples. He was the British ambassador to the Kingdom of Two Sicilies in Italy, southern Italy. Um, he was an enthusiast for collecting. Uh, and he had an eye for a market. He liked ancient pots. He reckoned they were rather good. They were cheap. He was also an archaeologist. Not coincidental, because I am. Um, he's also an archaeologist, and uh, he got into collecting pots. They were cheap. He put together a collection, and he published his collection. What you're looking at is a picture of him with a book, a beautiful folio of illustrations of pots from the ancient world with an introduction by the greatest, two of the greatest um, art historians of their day, claiming that these pots that are pots and pans, they're ceramics. They're not particularly wonderful. These pots are actually the equivalent of the great achievements of porcelain of the 18th century, the fine wares like Derby, high-end works of art. And they are equivalent to the achievements of the sculptors of the ancient world. Pottery is art. He put together his first collection at relatively no cost. He published it, the catalog, he had it illustrated by one of the finest engravers of Europe, Tischbein, and uh, he sold it to the British Museum, his collection, for 8,000 guineas. Um, okay, measure of value. At the time, you could live well on 50 pounds, 50 guineas. A guinea is uh, one pound five shillings. It's the, f it's the figure, the aristocratic currency unit, if you like, that you use to, for example, buy horses. Um, so it's a high end, it's, it's, this is status. 8,000 guineas, 50 pounds would buy you a great life on a yearly basis. A lot of money. It created a fashion, a style. Ancient pots, really something. Wedgwood capitalized on this. He copied Hamilton's works, showing that you could be part of a world of the 18th century of new technology, new manufacturing, within your price range, that was a match to the great achievements of the ancient world, and more. This is Horatio Nelson, one of the great figures of the late 18th century, an admiral, and uh, notoriously, Hamilton's wife, Emma, this is her, um, had an affair with uh, uh, Horatio Nelson in the last decades of the 18th century. It was well known in um, London society. Emma was one of those socialites uh, very well liked. Here she is in one of her attitudes. Her after dinner entertainments consisted of posing as a Greek uh, lady. She dressed up in Greek things, um, like the pots. And uh, after dinner, you'd have a drink and have your dessert, and she would do little playlets and then strike a pose. Uh, and here she is doing that. It, she was the height of London society. Horatio Nelson had an affair with it. This was the heart of stylish, late 18th century society. Hamilton was part of it. Wedgwood was part of it. These were his circle. Um, here he is. Hamilton, we know from the nose. And also, there is Emma. There's Horatio Nelson. This is a, this is a cartoon from a, a satirical publication. This is Vesuvius. We're in um, Naples here. Hamilton. Here he is. He loves his stuff, and he's forgetting about what's going on behind his back. And he's, in fact, well, the reference to Claudius is him, but it doesn't matter. This is where he's hanging out. The ancient archaeological excavations sponsored by the court of the Kingdom of Naples. 
So cutting edge style and society exploited, no, shaped by Wedgwood when ancient art met high tech. So what was Wedgwood doing as a designer? He was, yes, exploring new materials, factory production, all sorts, and also fundamentally doing something we're very familiar with today. The notion of Greek, Greekness, the Greek revival went viral in the end of the 18th century, as we would put it now. And Wedgwood was ahead of the curve on that. In fact, he was prompting it and precipitating it, as was Hamilton in a different way. Wedgwood was involved in the creation of taste and indeed a new consuming class who had money to spend on this kind of thing. So Wedgwood, the design thinker, what was he doing? He was forging connections. He wasn't just an industrialist. He wasn't just a designer who designed things and then realized them in factory production, which is how he's usually presented. He was far more interesting. He was forging connections between pyrometry, for goodness sake, modish lifestyle, the Hamiltons, the antique, high-tech material science, his Jasper wares, academic art history and taste, transport infrastructures, the canal system of industrial northern Europe, accounting procedures, I haven't even mentioned these, and the division of labor. He was moving between these spheres, pulling them together in a new way. He was smart because he was mindful. He was aware of what's going on in style and society. He's tuned in to the, let's call it the zeitgeist. He's tuned into the spirit of the times, making new connections. They're not brand new. His trick is to connect them in new ways. And here's the wonderful thing. Innovation as the shock of the old. That is remarkable. But we often think, you know, innovation's about the new, not necessarily at all. It's about new connections, not necessarily new components to those connections. So design is a process. Given the school lunches, given um, Wedgwood, what does this look like? Let's um, try and pull some of this together. Here's one of the diagrams, again, that you very frequently find. Uh, but let me just hopefully now connect this graphic with what I've just been telling you. Three components. Desirability, what's wanted? This is about need, yeah, but it's also about desire. Need and desire um, go together. Um, another key component in negotiating this world of design process and working your way through it and why it's not a method. It's the reconciliation of what people want and need with, of course, what is feasible, which basically means what technically you can do, uh, and what is viable, can you afford it? Because many things you can dream of and know you can achieve, but it'll just be too expensive. Your reconciliation of the three brings success. And that's typically people talk about this sweet spot here. So the process then that you've seen diagram and the previous diagram going from empathy through to uh, testing and then shipping, research, finding empathy, Wedgwood, empathizing with high upper end society, but not just them. He knows people are now socially mobile. They want to be part of that crowd. They want to be at Emma Hamilton's after dinner attitudes. Um, he's empathizing with that aspiration of the new middle classes and producing goods to answer that desire, need to improve. Um, collaboration, he can't do it on his own. He's with those who can manage the production lines, do the accounting procedures, do the R&D for parameters in his lab. Prototyping, he's constantly bringing out new things. And look at how his prototypes are kind of testing the market. He does a couple of pots that are copies of ancient pots. These become celebrity pieces. And the basis of the response to them, the response to his copies, allows him to monitor taste. He can tell whether they're successful or not. If they get written up in the London newspapers, he's making his mark. Um, Lunch to learn, that phrase that you might have come across, he tries things out on the market, gets response, modifies. And you can do that with uh, production lines. Uh, and of course, we can do it a lot more effectively now. Fail quickly, that's another key component of this. Get your mistakes up front so you don't spend too much on them. Uh, clarity and mindfulness. Uh, he's mindful of the zeitgeist. 
clarity in the uh, lunchrooms of San Francisco schools. Desirability, what actually do people want? Feasibility, as I say, viability. And what ultimately you're doing is fundamentally connecting product and process, company and community, that's your ecology in the 18th century. And the community, of course, is diverse and varied. And you need to be mindful very much of that and how it relates to desire and need. Um, these are uh, a feature of the world of design thinking now. These are two kind of method, we call them method cards, um, that help get our heads around, be mindful of the process. Remember, we're talking about the process. But it's not something that's a method. If you follow it like an algorithm, you, it's, it'll be... Um, it'll not necessarily work for you at all. It's a pragmatics. It's a know-how. Um, and that makes it sometimes difficult to get your head around. What do I do now? These kind of things are just summaries of options. What might you do here to find out about the people you're interested in? Well, you can look at the stories they tell. You can prototype things, put them in front of people, and see what their reactions are, and that helps you get to know them. You share things with people. Other ways of doing that are through very standard and well-tried and tested techniques like ethnography, participant observation. There's a whole suite of these methods. The process of design thinking, the art and science of design thinking, is to pull them together. Um, so it's kind of all over the place. Um, and that makes it, again, as I say, awkward, not just to get your head around, but, you, you, you know, how do you do it? Where do you start? Uh, and the key, like any of these things, I think, is you plunge in. Um, but here I've just kind of wanted to stand back a little bit from this plunging in. Design thinking, then. It's a paradigm, a kind of model. But remember, models don't necessarily match up directly to real life. So it's a kind of design thinking is kind of like ideal type. Um, that's what those diagrams do. But reality is rarely an ideal type. Uh, it's a process, yeah, a pragmatics, as I've said. It's an MO, a modus operandi, a way of operating, a menu of methods, attitudes, possibilities, and here you go, when thrown in the middle of things. So rather than, you know, try and... This is one of the biggest mistakes um, that any designer worth their salt knows, to think you can wipe the slate clean, that you start fresh. Or let's just start fresh, get rid of all the crap that we've had to deal with, start fresh, and we'll get it right. You never do. Because the world, well, we know what happens when you try and wipe the slate clean socially, when you try and get rid of the past to start a new, brave new world of a future. No. Um, it leads to disaster. Um, we've seen it too much in modernist design, and we know about the failures of modernist design. And I'll not say anything about Rotterdam. Um, so <laughs> no, being thrown in medias res, being thrown in the middle of things, and having to operate within that environment. Uh, and that means it's kind of, I'm moving towards it being a kind of attitude. It's a, it's a mindset. It's being thoughtful, mindful, collaborative. You're never going to be able to do it yourself. But it's about intervening creatively in the world such that it generates innovation. Um, and I know that sounds very vague, but I hope the examples have shown that actually it's incredibly specific. Um, and ultimately, I would say it's a way of human being but getting it right is exactly human well-being. If you get it right, the world works with you. And that is beautiful. And we know the success that design can have. Um, in all of this, this you know, association of design with human being, the way we operate in the world, this ecology that we all are part of, this habitat that is what it is to be human, um, it's by no means just for creative types. We're all part of this. Now, some of us are better than others at doing it, but it doesn't mean that it should be left simply to those who are seen as or define themselves as creative types. We're all creative types, because that's what it is to be human. Another argument I can make here is that we sometimes think that design is about invention, coming up with new things. No. Um, we all come up with new things every day. We all have flashes of insight every day. The issue is you can't put them into practice. Coming up with new ideas isn't the issue. It's implementing new ideas that's the issue. And that typically means you're stopped from doing it somehow. 
Now, those can be real reasons why you stop from doing it, because, you know, it just wouldn't work, or because it's unfeasible, it's unviable. But it can also mean that there's active forces stopping you being creative. Now, that's another political story. Uh, but it's part of this attitude towards design thinking. And I think you can see why I'm kind of evangelical about this. Because this is really getting to the heart of what it is to be human in terms of political association. And I'm political with a small p. How we constitute communities. Um, we're all designers, but of course some of us are less skilled, some more skilled. Um, the challenge really is learning how to do it well. Anybody can learn design thinking. That's one of the great things we find, uh, certainly in our experience in the D School of Teaching uh, Design Thinking. Uh, it, it, it sounds, again, the evangelical kind of tone is coming out here. It works every time. It might not be fabulously successful, but it's always successful. You always come up with something new. Um, and you can keep on improving. In fact, you never stop improving. Because it's human life. Right? It's a process. It's what we're all wrapped up in. Um, to design is to be human. And for that very same reason, it doesn't work well when it's rigidly defined and applied. That's why it's fuzzy. That's why it kind of seems that only some people can do it and some people can't. Because that's actually how we all are. If you come up with a rigid rule book, you do this, you do this, you do this, you know what the consequences are in terms of human living. It's too rigid. Control doesn't work like that. So it's a skill set which allows of different kinds of achievement. And um, with this notion, therefore, of design being, okay, human-centered. But remember here, and this is, the, again, another issue. This is a phrase that's used a lot in design now, human-centered design. Uh, it, it's thrown around a lot as a phrase uh, where I'm from, and, and you hear it a lot in uh, tech industries, and particularly those that want to you know, appear user-friendly. It's human-centered. Um, oh, I'd get into trouble if I talk about Palantir here, but uh, a company you might know about. Anyway, uh, they do human-centered design, you know. Anyway, um, uh, human-centered design, human-centered, what does that mean? It means ultimately that if you want to get to the heart of a design process, figuring out in this way, the so what question, so what, why should we do human-centered design? Well, because we're human and we care. Now, we can get into profit and all sorts of things there, absolutely. But ultimately, we're beyond that. We're in another world here where the best achievements are those that indicate a care for the people you're designing for. That's the business at the front end of finding out about kids and school and lunch, or finding out in a different way for Wedgwood about what makes the world of smart, socializing London Tick. He found that out, he got into their heads, cared about it, and delivered. Um, in the end, I think, even though we can get very technical about ethnography, for example, or um, journey mapping. Journey mapping is a lovely technique for breaking down an experience of when you go to the Lego event or facility how you get there, what happens when the door opens, what happens when you go into whatever the activity is in Lego building. I, I, I wish I knew now from our uh, uh, introductory talk. And then, you know, what happens, it's a journey map. You walk into something, you have experiences coming at you. And there's a very wonderful skill set um, for and, and set of techniques for, for coming up with such a specification of an experience, parsing it, breaking it down into components, with which you can act, components that you can make design actionable. Because in all of this, it's about, obviously, going through a process and coming up with something to share with people. Because you're addressing needs, you're addressing desires, and the world we live in, yeah, you need to make a living, you need to pay the mortgage. Um, that relationship involves an exchange of value. That's fine. Um, and there are ways of really getting technical, but ultimately there are two attitudes. And I've tried to describe what we, what we are calling design thinking as a kind of mindset. It's an attitude. More than one attitude. The first is, I know, it's, again, it sounds ever so vague, but I've illustrated it, I think, very specifically. Curiosity. You want to know what your kids feel and go through at school lunch. 
Wedgwood was curious about antiquity and about what it meant. He was curious about a new world of chemistry and archaeology. And he got into the minds of his community, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, empathy. You put yourself in that position. That's one attitude. But think of what it really means. It also means, you know, you can never stop learning. There's always more. One of the worst attitudes we see, I think, a contrasting attitude, is where you think you've got all the answers. Where, you know, you have a design team who know what people want. They've worked it all out. They've got the idea, the solution, and they're going to promote it. Boy, do, can, can anybody remember the Segway? <laughs> Segway was a remarkable piece of personal transportation. They spent, <laughs> reputedly, the research that went into it was $100 million. They had a massive factory in Connecticut, Manchester, New Hampshire, New Hampshire, um, that was going to produce 50,000 units a week, something like that. Um, they launched this product claiming it was going to, the, the hype was extraordinary. This was going to revolutionize personal transport in the world. It was one of the, I don't know if you've ever seen one, because <laughs> they were supposed to take over and be ubiquitous within the air. Um, but they're, they're, they're very clever. The engineering is wonderful. Two-wheel transport, a battery. You can move along up to 30 miles an hour on it by leaning forward. It responded to your bodily movements. Superb engineering. And nobody wanted one. Um, for good reason. It was like, what are you going to do? Drive along a sidewalk at 30 miles an hour? Um, and if you can't, there's crowds. What are you going to do? Bump into them and roll over them? If you go on the road, you're going to have a 40-ton you know, truck bearing down on you. That's going to make you feel really great, isn't it? Um, so it was like, and then people would say, oh, they're unsafe. There was legislation against them and all sorts. That was an example of designer arrogance, complete arrogance. We've got it all sorted out. We've got the venture capital. Um, we're going to build this thing because people will realize that we're super smart and that we've solved their problems. Um, that is a lack of curiosity. And it's also so narrowly focused on the engineering. Oh, we can do it. We can make it. Let's do it. It'll solve things. Um, so that's the opposite attitude. Arrogance, we know. We'll just go ahead. We don't need to learn from you. We don't need to ask you about what your life is like. We'll just help you. Sometimes it's quite uh, philanthropic like that. Um, sometimes it's just we'll make cash, a load of cash. But that's another attitude. Um, so lifelong learning, curiosity goes together. And then make to learn. Um, it's the launch to learn thing, get a product out there, work with the software now, um, software development, and I'm sure a lot of you are very, very well aware of this, absolutely appropriately works with a user group as soon as possible. Get to see how people are using, working with what you've got, and improve accordingly. And then when you've built up a certain user base, you can go more public because you've prototyped it and worked out a lot of the uh, bugs, alpha, beta, and then launch, etc. But get it out there, work. But there's something else deeper in this, and that is the intimate association of hand, heart, and mind. It's an old notion of handiwork, hands-on stuff. Having things in your hand makes a massive difference because it allows a full sensory engagement with that artifact, with that thing, with its environment. It puts it into your habitat, your ecology. And it brings emotional response, that's the heart, and a cognitive response, the mind. Thinking, feeling, acting go together. And I think that is another fundamental attitude that we sometimes forget. We get very conceptual. We separate out processes of making. So those, I would say, are our two key attitudes. That ultimately is what design thinking comes down to. But it does not in any way preclude extraordinarily subtle and sophisticated techniques that frustratingly you cannot apply automatically through a, a rule book, a cookbook, or an algorithm. It's actually much more human than that. And that is what makes it, I think, so crucial, so fundamental. And it is not some latest flash-in-the-pan idea coming out of an American business school. Thank you. <laughs>